Um, so hi again, <laughs> I guess, and officially hi. hi. I'm Caroline Greiser from uh, Stockholm University from the Department of Ecology, Environment and Plant Sciences. I'm a researcher here. Just, uh, I, I just got my PhD in forest microclimate and uh, the impacts on uh, plant species distributions. So um, I, I don't know exactly what type of lectures you are used to. I just have to uh, apologize in advance that I'm uh, that I have mostly been talking to to other researchers <laughs> the last years. So this one it could be like a bit too high or even too low for you. So I, I just hope that you will ask me questions afterwards uh, if something was not understandable or if you want to know more. And the aim of my presentation uh, is uh, first that I wanted to give you another reason why we should keep our forests and stop cutting down them. And then uh, the other is just giving you an example of what's going on for research right now on climate change, the impact on biodiversity and human land use. Um, and it will, it will be roughly 20 minutes, maybe short, that depends a bit on how nervous I am and how much I forget to say. Okay. So I work in the boreal forest, which covers most of Sweden and 11% uh, of the Earth's terrestrial surface. It stores a gigantic amount of carbon, but I will not talk about the role of forests on the global carbon budget today, but more on its direct effect on near ground temperatures. The, uh, the boreal forest consists of only a handful of forest or tree species. Um, so this is spruce and pine and maybe some birches and aspen here and there. But most of the biodiversity is found in the understory. And I will tell this story from the perspective of an understory plant and how it perceives its environment and its immediate climate around it. So the understory uh, biodiversity consists, when we talk about plants, um, uh, mostly of, of ericaceous shrubs and mosses and flowering plants and lichens, which are of course not, not exactly plants, but plants and mushrooms. Um, what we must not forget is that uh, even a large tree starts um, as a tiny plant in the understory as a seedling. So all the conditions down at the forest floor, they feed back also to the tree layer of the forest. The Borean forest in Sweden is uh, divided by a rather distinct biogeographical border called the Limes Norlandicus or Norlands Grenzen that divides the northern coniferous forest from the southern mixed forest. And uh, that border is very interesting because it marks the range limit of many northern and southern understory species. And that's also the area where I, uh, where I did my research in. So a warmer climate is expected to shift these range margins of both northern and southern species. So nor northern cold adapted species maybe retract towards the north because it's getting just too warm for them, or they are outcompeted by southern uh, warm adapted species that advance towards the north. But then there's this phenomenon called microclimate. Microclimate are, or is the climate near the ground. And near the ground, temperatures can differ strongly over very short distances. So you have, for example, southern uh, sunny slopes versus northern shady slopes. Um, you, have, uh, vegeta you have also vegetation effects, like northern and southern slopes. These are effects of terrain or topography. You can also have like higher elevations or colder or cold heavy air can collect in depressions, uh, which is called cold air pooling. So these are all terrain effects and then you have vegetation effects and the uh, the most obvious is that canopy shade the ground from incoming sun, sun radiation. And these temperature differences can again like uh, uh, they can be created over very, very short distances on very fine scales. 
Uh, another important aspect of my study system of the boreal forest is that it is heavily managed. So in Sweden, we practice this clear cut culture. That is, we basically remove entire forests and leave open landscapes. And that creates very strong temperature gradients close to the ground. So with all these effects, um, the, micro, or the, the climate driven rain shifts may look a bit more complex where southern warm adapted species could colonize warm microclimates outside of their range, like north of their range. And northern cold adapted species may not go extinct because it's getting too warm, but they could survive in cold pockets in the landscape, in cold microclimates. And this is the conceptual framework that I worked with and that I wanted to test because it sounds really cool, but um, that few people went out and actually looked for if that is true. And we were interested in if that is true because we, we want to give advice to conservation and management. So how can we adapt uh, land use to a warmer climate and at the same time try to keep our biodiversity? Um, the major challenge with this concept is that the standard climate data that are available are not useful. They, uh, they don't capture forest microclimate. So this is a weather station. Um, these are standardized, so they, they look basically the same all over the world. And uh, they, are, they measure climate uh, at, let's say, one to two meter height and on open field. So they are deliberately designed to exclude effects of forest, for example. And, and that is a problem. So I, I, cannot, I cannot trust those, uh, those climate data and, and climate maps that come from this data um, in order to, to study forest microclimate. The other uh, problem is the resolution. So you have probably all seen global temperature maps or even like national temperature maps, but they come in a very coarse resolution. So often in our latitudes, you could say like, you have one temperature value for a square of one, one kilometer. So, and that of course obscures a lot of fine, uh, fine scale variation near the ground. So what we need is microclimate maps that capture these differences, the, the, where you can find like the, the cold and the warm spots in the landscape. So I worked with the questions, where is it cold and why? Do the northern species actually like cold microclimates? I also study southern species, but I shortened that story here for you a little bit. And how can we guide forestry and conservation? So my most important tool was uh, a microclimate logger. This is about the size of a fingernail. And I mounted that on a holder uh, and installed it in an inverted plastic cup taped with duct tape to a wooden stick and then placed it out in the forest. And there it measured the climate that a forest floor plant actually experiences. Um, so I placed more than 200 of these loggers across the forest in central Sweden, uh, covering this Norland Skans and Limes Norlandicus. Um, and then uh, they measured microclimate over more than one year. And the graph in the lower right corner shows the distribution of temperature across the loggers in the summer, like these are the, the average temp, the average daily maximum temperatures over a month. And uh, what you see is that it is uh, that we have a large variation. So we have, we had one logger that was on average 35 degrees warm. This is really hot. And the coldest logger was only 15 degrees warm during the day. So this is, these are temperature differences that normally on the standard climate maps like cover hundreds of kilometers. Um, so, so I wanted to find out where are these cold places? And we can say that and we found out that during the warmest times, for example, summer days, uh, the forest canopy has the strongest cooling effect. So I made microclimate maps from my logger data and with maps of vegetation and terrain that were really high resolved. Uh, and in the lower left corner, you see like um, one like one small part of, of a microclimate map in the summer and you see red patches and blue patches, which are uh, warm and cold microclimates. 
And comparing that to a satellite image, you see like the red patch as a clear cut and the cold patch as a rather dense forest. So forest makes, at least when it comes to warm summer temperatures, uh, forest density make the strongest difference. So they have the strongest cooling effect. But there are also other effects. So for example, these terrain or topography effects that I was talking about earlier. So it is cold also at higher elevations. That's why the, on the very high mountains, there is always snow on the top. Um, it's cold on north facing slopes where the sun doesn't reach so often and so strong. It's also close to water. So water has a very uh, important buffering uh, effect on high temperatures. Uh, so these are all the terrain effects. And then you have the forest or the vegetation effects. So it's cold and dense forest under closed canopy, mostly because again, they are shading from the sun, but also away from forest edges. So you have probably heard of edge effects. So again, they are their forest edges are leaking cold air. So it's important if we want to keep a cold microclimate and forest um, during hot summer weather, then it's important to keep continuous forests and don't fragment them more further. We also found that the microclimate changes over time. So the picture that I just draw uh, or drew was, was for summer days, but in the night, the picture almost looked reverse. So on a clear cut, it gets really hot during the day, but it also gets really cold during the night. So it's very variable. And of course, um, forest canopies, therefore they buffer temperature fluctuations. So they are colder during the, during the day and they are actually warmer during the night. But many forest species are adapted to this type of buffering, uh, buffered climate. So here again, uh, you see a more open canopy where you have larger temperature fluctuations and then a more closed canopy with uh, not so large temperature fluctuations where, where the temperatures are more buffered both for the during the day from day and night but also across the year. Um, and this is actually the type of microclimate that the northern species liked. So I also went out in the same region and tried to find populations of many northern species. Like um, this was a bit like geocaching. So I downloaded uh, uh, coordinates from a citizen science database that were more or less uh, accurate. And then I went out on my GPS in the forest and tried to find that tiny moss species. And then when I found that, I put a logger there and that also measured microclimate again. And then I compared what the species experience to what is available in landscape, what is the average microclimate. And I found that they actually like this buffered microclimate. So my question, do the northern species like cold microclimates? Short answer, yes. A bit more differentiated answer is, well, they like it cold during the day, but they like it a bit warmer during the night. So in total, they like the stable microclimates, the buffered microclimates, but also places where later snow melt. And that could be uh, because they um, because they just cope better on places with a shorter growing season, where southern species that are normally more competitive, they don't thrive there. But I will not go so much into detail into the mechanisms why these patterns uh, occur. It's just this, this is what we found. The northern species occur on the more stable and colder places. And what type of habitats are these? Dense forests on northern slopes and shady ravines. For example, so here I I show some of those some of those types of habitats where the northern species would uh, would thrive at their southern range margin. So, and with these results, we can give advice to conservation and forest management. For example, keep dense old forests on shady slopes and ravines. Try to keep continuous forests and reduce fragmentation because again, forest edges they leak the cold, uh, yeah, they leak the cold air. Keep the water in the landscape and reduce drainage. Again, water and, and vicinity to water, soil moisture, all this uh, increases the buffering capacity of forest to extremes or to extreme temperatures. And then protect valuable microclimates for these threatened northern species and maybe even create buffer zones around that to again like to minimize the edge effects on these habitats. 
and for sure avoid this. <laughs> so this clear cutting culture uh, is from a, it has uh, many other disadvantages, um, uh, but also from a microclimate perspective, it uh, is rather invasive, like it creates very strong uh, temperature differences, which uh, the forest floor plants maybe may not cope with. All right, so to sum that up, weather stations and standard climate maps, they don't capture microclimates in the forest. Uh, forest microclimate buffers extreme temperatures, so it's they are colder during the days and warmer during the night. And northern species that are like that occur on their southern range margin where they are threatened by global warming, they survive or they could survive in cold and stable microclimates. Uh, that means that we can protect and maybe even create those favorable microclimates because forest management shapes the microclimate landscape and therefore it can slow down or speed up local extinctions in a warmer climate. Yeah, that was it from my side. So if you have questions, shoot. I can also sh stop sharing. I don't know. I again, like I, I don't know what you're what you're used to, what your format is, and um, I don't even know who's the host now. Is it Tuya? Tuya? No. I I think she she turned off at least most of her um, mic and speakers, I guess. Yeah. I don't know why she's still visible though. I don't know. Maybe she forgot to turn off the camera. Yeah, probably. So you, I, I do have a question. You talked mainly now about Northern, uh, Northern species. Um, so does that mean that Southern species, it, can exist in or prefer more variable and extreme climates or yeah no okay <laughs> no, they, they don't but um so so it's not that the northern species would would like the clear cuts for example uh, it's not like that so we we studied only one southern species but in, in very detail uh, we did also transplant experiments and try to test like, hmm, does it like it more cold or more warm? But all of the, all, all of the species, both Northern and Southern, they, they are forest species. So they like the forests, but then within forests, you have like more open forests and you have more closed forests. And you have also deciduous forests, like with birches and aspen. Uh, and then you have more coniferous forest. And the northern species, they were more adapted to this coniferous forest type, which is also very dark in the spring because they never shed their needles. You know, they're always dark. Whereas the southern species, it, it, it was more adapted to this uh, deciduous forest that during the spring have a very open canopy. So the sun can, uh, can reach the ground. So it starts growing, it's, it, was an, it was a perennial species, so it lives for several years. So it starts growing from its roots in early spring. And then just before the canopy closes, it, it has basically developed ready where it had finished developing. So it was more this type of, of differences we've, we found between Northern and Southern species. So the Southern more deciduous trees or deciduous forest, Northern more coniferous forest. You say uh, northern um, species are threatened. Is that because of uh, deforestation or because of uh, warming microclimates? OK, it was more an assumption that we made. So when okay. you look at the distribution of the species now, so we just look at the map, where does it occur and where doesn't it occur? Yeah. Well, it occurs in northern Sweden, but it doesn't occur in southern Sweden. So we, we assumed they occur in the north because they like it a bit colder. Um, and and uh, but that was what I was also testing, like in my in my research, like do they at least at their range margin, do they also stick to the colder places in the landscape? And they do. 
Yeah, okay, right. Then but I'm with you. yeah. And then, of course, they are because management is so strong in the Swedish forest. Um, I, I think they're most of all threatened by, by management, but it's a combination because this management creates again like temperature differences, and that together with global warming will maybe make effects even stronger. Gotcha. Mm. So global um, the, the predictions, at least for Sweden, are also that the extreme temperatures uh, increase. So you have stronger fluctuations. You have more of those uh, heat waves, for example. So that that makes it uh, this is extra important to keep a continuous forest layer. That's my perspective, at least. Okay. Cool. So is there any more questions? No. I don't know how you do this, but then maybe you can stop the recording. <laughs> I can Yeah, ask. well, that's Toya. Yeah. So uh, but maybe we can, but we can we can also can all it. we can all leave the room and then she will eventually <laughs> click on the stop. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that works. I can I can I can uh, I can drop her an email. But uh, thanks. thanks. That's a really thanks, good um, presentation. Uh, yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, and and Bye. yeah. Just contact me if you if you need to know more or if you whatever. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm open. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Goodbye.